This morning on Wake Up With Hope, we're taking an artistic journey through a story of ransom. Plus, the healthy foodie is back and cooking burritos, and we have much, much more. Stay with us. Good morning, happy Wednesday to you, and welcome to Wake Up With Hope. You know, it's a brand new day and a brand new opportunity to start fresh. Mm -hmm. You know, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, our inner self is being renewed day by day. That's right, and as you begin this new day, we want to remind you that God promises to be with you wherever you go. And we pray that you will cherish this thought as you go throughout your day today. Well, it's another lovely day here at Wake Up With Hope, and today it's also International Day of Education. Hmm, very yeah. good. It's you know, a day to learn something new then, right? For sure. <laughs> it's a perfect day. And we have lots of new things and relevant things to share with you today, so stay tuned. We're going to have an amazing program. And let's begin by taking a look back at what took place on this day in history. On this day in history, in 2006, the renowned company Pixar, known for its blockbuster hits such as Toy Story in 1995 and A Bug's Life in 1998, was acquired by the Walt Disney Company, its long-term distributor, and they paid an astounding $7.4 billion. In a deliberate move to preserve its distinct creative approach and unconventional corporate culture, Pixar and Disney remained physically separate entities. Pixar continued to operate from its headquarters in Emeryville, California, while Disney maintained its base in Burbank. You know, in our own spiritual journey, there might be situations where external circumstances or changes occur. Just as Pixar retained its identity while being a part of Disney, we too can stay rooted in our core beliefs and values, despite external influences. This echoes the importance of maintaining our spiritual identity, remaining true to principle, and finding ways to integrate them into every new experience or environment. You know, even amid life's changes, we should maintain genuine spirituality, holding on to Jesus, and remembering that He alone can and bring meaning and purpose, regardless of the changes that go on all around us. Mm. And so we need to stay faithful and keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen. Amen to that. Well, this morning, the Healthy Foodie is back teaching us how to make delicious, hearty, and healthy mm. breakfast burritos. Let's get cooking. To start your day off right, you know, it's always good to have a nice, healthy breakfast. So today we're going to make breakfast burritos. We're going to start this one with scrambled tofu. Um, we cubed up some tofu and added it to sauteed uh, onion and bell pepper and some other seasonings. It is all cooked and ready. We've got cubed and diced and oven roasted potatoes. They're seasoned and they're ready to go. And then we also want um, sauteed onion and bell pepper in there too. We're going to use corn, or excuse me, we're going to use flour tortillas on this one. I like them, they are a little more pliable. Um, corn tortillas will break apart for this. Um, we'll start off with the scrambled tofu. There we go. And then some of the potatoes. These potatoes are great. They're kind of like in this, um, along the lines of like breakfast potatoes. We have some roasted edges. And then we want some veggies in there sauteed onion and bell pepper. There we go. All right, this is gonna be even better with this cilantro lime cream. This is one of my favorite Mexican toppings. You can use it in enchiladas, burritos, you know, anything really. We're gonna start this one with veginase or vegan mayo. And we need cilantro with this. So fresh cilantro works best and we're gonna dice it, chop it real small. So it kind of gets incorporated all throughout the sauce. There we go. And then we have some chili lime seasoning. This has dried lime and a little bit of chili powder. It's not spicy, but it does have salt in it, so too much will make the dish too salty. There we go. And you can see when you start mixing the two together, 
the little bits of chili show up in there and you get the lime or the cilantro. And then we're gonna add the lime juice to it. We wanna thin it down just a little bit and give it an extra kick of lime. This one has a nice acidic bite to it and it's creamy and it really goes great on these burritos. All right. And then finally, I like to add salsa verde to this one. You can use um, regular picante salsa if you like, but I just tend to like this one. There you go. All right. Again, these are really filling, pretty easy to get together. If you have some of these other ingredients ready, um, you can make them for breakfast, you know, all throughout the week. But that's it, they're ready to go. Have you ever wondered how much you're worth? Let's take an artistic look and decipher this question once and for all on today's Masterstroke episode. In the Getty Museum is The Ransom by John Millay. This painting shows a 16th century knight paying a ransom in return for his two daughters. You can see one captor holding a bag full of money. The other is holding on tight to one hand of each girl. Everyone, including the dog, has their eyes focused on the scene. The knight is handing over the precious jewels, while the two girls squeeze themselves into the safe chest of their father. When I was looking at this painting, a story from Venezuela came to my mind. In this story, a young girl was kidnapped and the ransom requested was $10 million. Now you can imagine the worry that was within the heart of the parents. Now just say a man called the father and said, I've got some good news. Your daughter's been kidnapped. They want $10 million. I think I can get you another girl and this one will only cost you 50,000. Do you think the father would be interested? Well, no. Why? He doesn't just want a girl, he wants his girl. Sometimes we think that because God has billions of people, we don't really matter. The Bible says, you are bought with a price. In the world of art, the value of an object is dependent on how much someone is willing to pay. For instance, Malay tried to sell this painting, The Ransom, for a thousand pounds, but no one wanted it. Now it's housed in one of the most famous museums in the world, and it's worth literally millions of dollars. So what did God pay to ransom you? Peter wrote, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. God paid the highest price imaginable, not silver or gold, but the precious blood of Christ. Your price was His life. What is God worth? A million, a billion, a trillion. In God's view, His worth is the same as your worth. So what's the key message of this painting? You are priceless. When we return, we'll have the first episode of a new series on the seven deadly relationship sins from Dr. Jennifer Jill Schwerzer and later John Bradshaw joins us to share a devotional thought. And don't forget, if you're enjoying today's show, share it with a friend or visit our website at hopetv.org slash wake up and check out our YouTube channel. Simply search for Wake Up With Hope and keep up with each one of our episodes. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Wake Up With Hope. Have you ever said something only to be completely misinterpreted or taken out of context? Misinterpretation is one of the killers of any relationship. How can you overcome this? Dr. Jennifer Jill Schwerzer explains on today's series of the seven deadly relationship sins. A man said to his wife, you look beautiful in blue. She said, 
Oh, you think I look ugly in red. He said, I love your curves. She said, you think I'm fat. He said, they say the gentlemen prefer blondes, but I love your long, dark hair. She said, how often do you think about blondes? He said, you sing like a bird. She said, you mean a crow? He kept trying to communicate compliments to his wife, and she kept misinterpreting him. And finally, he stopped trying. A group of researchers at the University of Denver put together a program called C-PREP. And in the program, they identify four traits that present in almost all failed relationships. Number two are strong predictors of divorce. Number three are often learned in the home of origin. And number four tend to neutralize all the good that may exist in that relationship. Those four traits are escalation, invalidation, negative interpretation, and withdrawal. We're going to focus now on negative interpretation or misinterpretation. The next deadly relationship sin is misinterpretation. Negative interpretation is associated with major depressive disorder and anxiety. Clinicians like myself recognize that it's the way we think about situations that ultimately determines how we feel about situations. To some degree, the circumstances that we encounter in life are, are kind of neutral and up to us to interpret. Let me give you an example. Someone comes into the school cafeteria and they see a group of friends. As soon as they come into the cafeteria, the friends stop talking. That individual can interpret that situation in one of three ways. They can interpret it positively. Well, they stop because they're about to ask me to join the conversation. They can interpret it negatively. Well, they were talking about me. Or they can interpret it neutrally. Uh, they finished their conversation. That's why they stopped. What we find is that certain individuals have what we might call a negative bias. They tend to see negativity where no negativity exists. Those people that are negatively biased tend to misinterpret things that other people say, and often to an extreme degree. And then they experience emotional disturbance proportionate to if that was actually true. This can be extremely frustrating for the person being misinterpreted, and it can actually drive that person away to where they just throw their hands up in despair. The replacement for misinterpretation is what I call checking in. Checking in involves seeing if the way you're interpreting that person is actually correct, and that involves active listening that we've talked about in other segments. Active listening is tuning into that person and making sure that you're picking up what they're putting down. One technique that I use in counseling to help people learn active listening in a very simple, kind of concise way is using the acronym E-A-R. Empathy equals ask and reflect. Good, empathic, active listening involves two basic activities asking open-ended questions of that person and giving them an opportunity to express themselves, how they really feel, creating a safe environment in which they can tell the truth about themselves and their feelings, and then also reflecting back to them what you heard them say. So if that individual says, I love you in blue, you might say, well, it seems like you really, you really like it when I wear blue, is that right? And you've interpreted that person correctly. However, if you're inclined to interpret them negatively, you might say, are you saying that I don't look good in other colors? And that person would have an opportunity then to correct that misconception. No, 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 I'm not saying that at all. I love you in all colors. I just especially like you in blue because it brings out the blue of your eyes and I love your eyes. It just really pays to check in. So I wanna challenge you to do something. I wanna challenge you to ask at least three people if you tend to interpret negatively, if you tend to put a negative skew on the things that they say to you, and if more than one of them says you do, you got some, some work to do in learning how to interpret things correctly. Learn how to check in, how to make sure that you're interpreting them the way they want to be interpreted, and use the EAR acronym to make sure that you're listening well.
If you're enjoying today's program, be sure to share it and spread a little positive inspiration. You can also visit our website at hopetv.org slash wakeup. We have to stop for a quick break now, but after the break, we will have today's devotional thought by Pastor John Bradshaw. We learn a lot as we journey through life. Our teachers might be family, neighbors, or even colleagues. But it can be difficult to find a mentor who truly understands our heart, our dreams, our goals. Someone who can help us overcome our deepest challenges. The Bible reveals that God wants to be your closest mentor, teacher, and friend. At Hope Channel, we can help you find freedom, healing, and hope in Jesus and the wisdom in His Word, the Bible. We pray that the courses at Hope Da Study will help you find answers to your deepest questions. Let's walk together toward a deeper experience of wisdom and joy. Welcome back, friends. John Bradshaw from It Is Written is with us here today to share a devotional thought. Hey, it's great to see you. I'm John Bradshaw from It Is Written. I'm, I'm thrilled that we have a, a moment here and I want to share something with you that I hope will encourage you and encourage your day, maybe, maybe even your week. When I wore a younger man's clothes, I traveled from my home country in New Zealand to London, England. It was a well-worn path. It was a rite of passage for young Kiwis. You leave home, you travel to Europe for a few years, you live in London, you earn pounds, they go a long way, you have fun, maybe too much fun, maybe not all good, but you know, young worldly kids seeing the world for the first time, travel the continent, go to places you've never been before, see what you've never seen before, and then go home to New Zealand and pick your life up and live responsibly. That was, that was the plan. So I traveled to London, England. I remember arriving at Victoria Station. We flew into Gatwick, uh, that's southwest, I think, south or southwest of, of London, a little way out. Got on the Gatwick Express. That train took us to Victoria Station, a friend and I. And then I had to figure out how to get to Wimbledon because my friend Nick was living in Wimbledon and my good friend John and I were going down to Wimbledon and we're going to stay with Nick while we got on our feet and found a job and then found a place to live. Easy peasy. So the challenging part came when we got to Victoria Station, got off the Gatwick Express, looked around, never been in an airport, a, a, a railway station, nearly this big, gigantic thing. It's a very, very busy station. And so we realized we had to go to the district line, the, the green line on the London Underground that, on the tube map, and that would take us to Wimbledon, same place where the tennis is played. So we're going to Wimbledon, but we had to get to Wimbledon. We had to take the subway, the tube, in order to get there. No problem. <laughs> so I recall going to this ticket machine, see the tube map, and there's people everywhere, and there's a ticket machine. I had to figure out how to navigate the ticket machine. Never seen one like it in my life. Figured it out, got a ticket. So then had to go through the turnstiles. You put in the ticket, the gates open, flip like that, and then you've got to go through and, and, that's, and pick up your ticket on the other side. You're familiar with that. So I've got a pack on my back, a bag over this shoulder, a bag over that shoulder, and a bag in each hand. And I think a camera around my neck. I, I was the size of the Michelin man. And I went up to the turnstile, put in my ticket, the machine grabbed it, it popped up at the other side, the, the little barrier doors flipped open like that and I tried to go through. And man, I couldn't fit, I was this wide, I couldn't get through, I had all these bags hanging off me. And so I turned to go sideways, but, but I didn't have a sideways because I was just as wide sideways practically and then the doors closed, bloop, and all the people are backing up behind me and I'm standing there thinking, oh man, welcome to London. What am I going to do? It was morning. There were plenty of people. I don't think it was rush hour, but it couldn't have been much after that. People everywhere, and I'm stuck. My ticket's on the other side. The door opened and closed. What do I do? It was then that a man from the London Underground called me. Mate, he said, mate, over here. So I went over there. He said, you're never going to get through there with all that baggage. You're never going to get through. Oh, no, no, that's not what he said. He said, you're never going to get through that narrow gate with all that baggage. Interesting, he would say that. Jesus talks about us getting through the narrow gate. And one of the reasons we find it hard to squeeze through is because of all of our baggage, you know? 
it says in Hebrews 12 and verse 1, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Sometimes, many times, most of the time, maybe all the time, that which is preventing us from having a closer walk with Jesus, a more satisfying Christian experience, a better life, is the baggage we carry around. Just baggage. You'll hear about this person who doesn't get on with that person. Ah, and why? Well, because that person said, did, thought, broke, whatever the case might be. Okay, so that person did. But what you've got is baggage. You can afford to just let it go. Well, I don't want to let it go. Okay, so you want to carry your heavy baggage and try and get through that narrow gate that I was trying to get through. It just cannot be done. Sometimes it's the lifestyle that we choose. We are less interested in God than we might be because we've allowed ourselves to get distracted by all the stuff. You know, according to the Bible, sin can be pleasurable. It talks about Moses forsaking the pleasures of sin for a season. It's all seasonal. The reason I say this is because this is the, the where the rubber meets the road part of Christianity. You want to walk with Jesus, but sometimes you're tripping yourself up by, by putting a stumbling block before your own feet. It might just be the baggage. We want to get through a narrow gate. What do we do about our lifestyle? We've learned to love the secular. You know what you can do? You can learn to love the spiritual. You can. That person who's killing themselves eating, I'm going to be stereotypical, burgers and fries every day, that person needs to put away the burgers and fries and start eating broccoli. Now, is broccoli, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, are they naturally going to appeal to the person who's accustomed their taste buds to appreciate burgers and fries? And again, I'm generalizing here. You understand what I'm saying, right? You have a ghastly diet. Suddenly you want to eat a salad, something low fat. What that takes is dedication and application and a little training. And before long, you're going to love edamame and you're going to love you know, green stuff prepared well. You're going to love it because it's magnificent. But if you've trained yourself to love something else, then there's a very good chance that you won't love what actually loves you. You see what I'm saying? So you can be somebody wrestling with Christianity. You'd like to be a Christian, but uh, it leaves you a little cold. It might just be all that baggage you're carrying around. It might be because you're spending so much time in secular stuff. I mean, you're going to go to church and sit in the Bible study class and be turned on by that when the rest of your waking hours you're watching uh, a multi-million dollar productions on Netflix. How does a Bible teacher compare with movies that cost hundreds of millions of dollars to make? You see, you're, you're, you're uh, teaching yourself not to love the things of God because of the baggage in your life. Sometimes it's bitterness. That's baggage, man. Grudges that you're holding against other people. That's just baggage. The way you approach life, sometimes just filled with baggage. So you know what we need to do if we want to get through that narrow gate? Lay aside the weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us. We go to Jesus. We say, you know what I'm ready for? I'm ready for you to take out of my life all the junk that shouldn't be in there. There are some things that, there may be some things that are preventing me from appreciating you and walking closely with you take them away. Have you ever had a conversation with God like that? If you haven't, it's time. We talk to God and we say, Lord, I want to lay aside the weight. If there's something preventing me from getting through that narrow gate, I want to yield it. I want to give it up. I want to give it back, I'll give it over to you. Take that away and then give me something to replace that and help me to love that. Teach me to love that. And he'll do that. I eventually got through that narrow gate dragged myself and my bags to a district line train and we trundled from Victoria Station all the way down to Wimbledon. We met up with my friend Nick, got set up, established and, and then moved out and moved on. Taught me something. You can't get through the narrow gate if you're carrying a bunch of baggage. It's true for salvation. Salvation is, according to God, a narrow gate. I mean, it's difficult or onerous, but it's narrow. If there are some things that you need to lay aside, lay them aside. Thank God that you're able to and watch God bless your life. Great to see you. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor John. 
And thank you for watching Wake Up With Hope and spending your morning with us. You know, we enjoyed our time together. We always do. And don't forget, friends, to join us tomorrow. We'll be chasing waterfalls in a special feature. And Faith for Today will join us to share a devotional thought as well. Plus, we will have an insightful talk on the most important thing in parenting. So don't miss it. And if you enjoyed today's devotional thought and you would like to learn more, visit hope.study to receive your free Bible study guides. Again, friends, that's hope.study. We are sure our free Bible studies will be a blessing to you. And also, don't forget to follow us on YouTube to keep up with us there as well. And we can't leave without sharing our daily Bible promise. And today's promise is found in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10. It says, Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Mm, that is so comforting. You know, friends, there's nothing at all that can cancel out God's love and compassion for us. There's nothing, nothing. He loves you. He has promised you peace and circumstances won't affect his promises. Amen. That is so true. Very we have true. experienced that over and over again and we pray that you have too. And we hope that as you have begun this day with a grateful heart because of Jesus' love and hope in your life, that God will use you to bless someone else today also. Have a great Wednesday. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you that today we have experienced your faithfulness. Your compassion has been new today and we have received so much blessing. And today, Lord, as we go throughout our day, we want to keep you with us, keep you very close. So fill us with the Holy Spirit and may we be mindful of you. May we set our minds on things above. Again, we thank you for the hope that you have poured into our lives today. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.